Hi, Mia. How are you doing today? Hi, Heather. It's great to see you. So can you tell us a little bit about what are Big Assumptions? Yeah, you bet. So Big Assumptions, the idea is that these are assumptions that we have maybe about ourselves or the nature of the world, the nature of the work that we do, and they are very big and all-encompassing and often very sort of black and white, but they're also subconscious. We're often not even aware that we have them, or at least we haven't really taken the time to sort of surface them and think about them critically. And so they have this hold on us that impacts what we do, and we're not always aware of it until we start to go through this process called immunity to change, where we really try and surface and interrogate them. Oh, that's really interesting. So um, why is that important to us? Like, why, why should we care about what our big assumptions are? So the problem with the big assumptions is that they wind up creating this immune system. So just like our bodies have our physical immune system that is meant to keep us safe from harm and to very quickly recognize threats and, and move away from them, we have a psychological immune system that's meant to keep us safe from harm, um, often through making sort of assumptions about what's threatening and what's not. And the problem with that is just like our physical immune system, it can be overactive, it can be dysregulated. It can basically keep the status quo at the expense of us being able to actually move forward with making changes that we want to make in our lives or in our work. Mm, so like holding us back from doing the things that we actually want to do, that we know exactly. we sh should do, but are like, oh, why don't I feel like I should do this? So Exactly. I mean, how many times have you thought, oh, I really want to do this thing, and then you feel like, well, you've got one foot on the gas pedal, but somehow one foot on the brake, and then just nothing ever changes. Yeah, yeah, very common. So can you give an example of that, especially in online CPD? Sure. Um, would you like to give it a try? Would it be okay if I worked through an example with you? Oh, sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, great. So I know you're so passionate about improving CPD through incorporating technology and especially taking it online and you have so much experience with it. But I remember that when we were first getting to know each other, I was really surprised to hear you say that you didn't consider yourself to be an expert on this. And I think a lot of people can really relate to that feeling that, you know, I've got to be an expert to foster change, especially if I'm going to be leading others or bringing them along. So I was wondering if that assumption that you have to be an expert um, ever sort of holds you back from doing the work that you want to do in CPD. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I've been reflecting a lot on that lately. If, if, if I'm in this and passionate about it, and I feel like there's one foot on the brake sometimes, how do others feel about this? Yeah, so I'll give an example. Lately, I was doing high flex learning, which means some of our learners are online and some of our learners are in person, which is a new way of, uh, well, it's not new new but we're starting to use it more in CPD as we start to come out of the pandemic a little bit and um, you know I was really excited to do to do this you know I've written about it taught about it even doing a little bit before the pandemic but I really wanted to do it well now and um, I'd say like it boiled down to four things that were putting my foot on the brake uh, number one was the logistics and the extra time and I was like ah oh, I don't have time for this right now to try and arrange not only the room but all the online logistics and you know it gets complicated and then number two you know I sat there thinking oh my god I'm already feeling a little burnt out and I don't want to let down my co-facilitator and you know um, you know there was this a worry about let's not rock the boat let's just keep doing what we know works in these environments but then you know you'd still want to keep pushing it and try new things so then it comes down to the the learners well you know these paying learners we want to give them the best experience that they can have and if we already have something that kind of works why rock the boat why possibly uh you know make their learning experience worse if things mess up and then mm -hmm. i think number four is this idea of your own identity as a as the um as an educator especially an online educator you know if i'm kind of thinking well i'm teaching about this so if i get on there and it messes up well, what does that look like in terms of like do i actually know my stuff and um yeah so yeah, lots yeah, of reasons. So, 
Oh yeah. Um, it's so, it's so rich when you start to dig into it. So especially that last one, I think these identity thoughts can be some of the most powerful ones. So take that to its extreme. What would be the worst thing that could possibly happen if you were trying to, you know, teach online through high flex and something didn't work? Like where would your brain go? You know, that two in the morning, worst case scenario thought. Yeah. So everything explodes. Everything looks horrible. The learners are all disappointed. They all put on their feedback, worst session ever. Um, they don't want to come back and, and experience anything else. Um, they, they have in their mind that high flex sucks. I am never doing this. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's an example. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, some people even go to and they'll say I'm a terrible teacher and I'll lose my job. And I, you know, so what I'm hearing you say is that you're clearly committed to, you know, improving CPD through incorporating technology, through trying high flex. And at the same time, you know, you're committed to not losing your job or at least not losing, you know, the trust of your learners, not having them be, you know, burnt out and dissatisfied with what you're doing, um, not having things fail. And, you know, in that case, it's totally understandable why you would be hesitant to really be full throttle pursuing this idea of change um, that, you know, that you're wanting to, to really advance. And so I'm hearing that there's a lot of big assumptions in there about, well, if the technology doesn't work, everyone will think I'm a failure and they'll think I'm a terrible educator about technology or if this isn't comfortable for learners, then they'll never accept doing it again. And I think where those big assumptions, you know, now that we've sort of gotten them out into the open, then we can start to ask like, well, is it really true that they would never do high flex again if they had one, you know, maybe slightly not perfect experience with it? Is it really true that people would lose respect for me and I'd lose my job if I, you know, didn't know one thing about uh, how to, you know, how to do high flex or something like that? Um, and is this like when I know you were saying this is where you test these assumptions out to see if they're true or not? Yeah, exactly. So I'm wondering, you you were telling me about this specific scenario, was there anything that happened next for you to be able to start to push back on those a little bit? Yeah, a few interesting thing, things happen. And, you know, let's be honest, this doesn't always go as smoothly as, as promised. Even if you have everything practiced and, and you're pretty sure it's going to go well, Tech can sometimes have a mind of its own, but in this case, uh, we were we were um, fortunate. And I think the other thing that uh, I reflected on is as we were doing it. So we had a high flex enabled classroom. I also brought this tech in called the Owl, so that people could see these two perspectives on how you can do it. And we had these options for our learners, like, hey, we're going to try this out. Let's learn together. So we kind of made it a comfortable learning environment where mistakes could happen. And then we gave them the option: Do you want to play it safe? Here's here we could have the breakout rooms for people who are online, online, and the breakout rooms for people who are in person, in person. And they said, no, let's do this. Let's jump in. Let's do it the hardest way possible. So we had these mixed breakout rooms and we were going back and forth. And it was just so interesting approaching it with curiosity rather than feeling ultimately responsible for everything. And I think that just changed the whole dynamic of it. And it, it worked really well. I love that, that you sort of said, you know, yes, I recognize that I have all of these assumptions and fears and worries, and, and we're going to see what happens. We're going to see how it goes. Even if something isn't perfect, the world isn't going to end. Um, and that and that you were able to really kind of break through some of those things that were holding you back. Yeah, so now I'm just really curious about what the rest of the community is thinking. So what are their big assumptions? 